Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and each week I meet with military veterans to learn about what they do in their civilian career, how they got there, and advice for other veterans seeking to do the same. Today's episode number 199 with John Fenzel. And then we saw the second plane hit, and people asked me what's going on. I said, it's, it's a coordinated terrorist attack. I walked down to the Secret Service, the Uniformed Secret Service agent at the end of the hallway, and I remember his name was Todd, and I said, Todd, what are you hearing? And he, he said, nothing, really. And at that point, the, uh, the phone rang, and the, uh, they, they said that the Pentagon had been hit. And at that point, you know, kind of there was, it wasn't bedlam at all. In fact, it was a very organized response. But suddenly you saw guns coming out of walls and everything that you never, ever thought were there. As you'll learn in a moment, John has an extremely impressive background. He's been in the White House. He has been successful in and out of the military. He is a published author of three different books. He is a man who does not like to to get bored. Um, There's so much that we cover in this interview that I think is applicable to all of you listening, regardless of your intended career path. We talk about failure and learning from it. We talk about telling your story. He's an author, but no matter what you do, uh, he talks about telling your story. We talk about resilience. Um, He has had many different impressive career impacts, but he's had a, a common thread of resilience through all of them. We talk about having a plan and being okay if that plan goes by the wayside and understanding your own personal mission. If you're enjoying this podcast, I would um, recommend you check out the coaching program at beyondtheuniformity.io. It is all about self-knowledge. It's all about uncovering that next mission, uh, whether you're in the military now or whether you've been out for a decade. Um, and uh, as always, at the show notes at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find links to everything we discuss, as well as a text transcript, thanks to Kathleen Dillon. Uh, so with that, let's dive in to my conversation with John Fenzel. Well, normally in Annapolis, Maryland, but joining me today from Myrtle Beach is John Fenzel. John, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Oh, thanks, Justin. It's great to be here with you all. So I wanted to give listeners a very abbreviated bio. John is a senior Army Special Forces officer who has served on our nation's battlefields throughout Europe and the Middle East for over 30 years. He has served as a military assistant on the personal staff of the Secretary of Defense, as a special assistant to the Vice President, and as a White House Fellow during the Clinton and Bush administrations. He is the author of three books, the Fifth Column, The Sterling Forest, and The Lazarus Covenant. John is a graduate of the Naval War College and the um, National War College. He was born in Iowa and raised outside Chicago, and he lives with his wife and three children in Annapolis, Maryland. So John, maybe to start things off, and I I ask this because you have such a tremendously unique background, Uh, if you were talking to someone on active duty, how would you explain what you currently do for a living? No, that's a that's a good question, Justin. I'm I'm still trying to to answer that for myself. <laughs> you know, it's a it's been a it's been a great ride. You know, I spent uh, I spent as you mentioned, you know, three decades in uniform, and you know, I started off as a as a chemical officer. I ended up as a special forces guy. You know, as a Green Beret, and and so you know, I, but you know, like like any of us, you know, um, who have been in uniform, you know, and I don't care what rank you you are, I don't care. Um, you know, uh, what your position is, how, how, you know, junior or senior you are, everybody goes through this kind of sheer moment of, of, of uh, terror where you're trying to figure out, okay, what's next. And so I did that and uh, I'm not afraid to admit it either. It was, it was really um, an incredible experience. And I, and I think it's also a beneficial one for, for all of us. But uh, I, when I got out of uh, the army, as I, when I retired, I went to work for a company that really was focused on helping veterans and their families. I headed up um, their corporate foundation, um, and we helped an awful lot of uh, veteran families along the way. So I'm, I'm really proud of it. Um, I, I tell people I kind of feel like I got a Harvard MBA in those you know five or six years that I was there. And, and so after, after doing that um, and being in the corporate world as well, I realized that there, the, this whole topic of of leadership and, and values and ethics is, you know, it, it's just as relevant today as, as it's ever been. But I also realized that 
Um, leadership is also misunderstood. It's, it's mistaught. It's re- misrepresented. So just a few months ago, I talked to my wife when we both made a decision to try to help um, to try to help uh, organizations and teams and people meet their full potential. And so that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're trying to create a an experiential methodology that you know uh, uses you know all of these battlefields that we've got here on the on the east coast um, and especially here in the mid atlantic ranging from you know yorktown to gettysburg and and we're even going to kind of extend ourselves you know off to normandy um, in the next several months so you know it's it's really been a great experience and and you know we're just a couple months into this but uh, we're having a blast doing it so that's uh, that's in a nutshell what we're doing right now i also I also am an author, as you mentioned. I, you know, I've written three novels, and uh, we're going to um, write some more, and we're going to also kind of branch off into the nonfiction realm as well. Mm. I love, I love that soundbite though of of helping people and teams reach their full potential. And I'm excited to get into this in the interview. But you seem to exemplify someone who's reaching for your full potential. You you have such a broad array of things that you're working on, and any one of these things, the author or the, the work that you're doing with your own business, any one of them I imagine would be completely immersive and, and you're doing them simultaneously. So it's, it's really cool to see someone who is uh, constantly pushing their own boundaries. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it's it's all about, you know, trying to figure out a way to continue to serve. And that's what I was looking for when um, when I was preparing to retire. And and um, and now if we can continue to do that, that's what I'd really love to be able to do. You know, unfortunately, there's no hard and set roadmap for any of this. You got to make some of it up as you go along. But that's half the fun, right? <laughs> Um, well, maybe to start off, I'd love to learn about, could you just kind of walk us through in more detail? So how after serving for so long in the military with the Green Beret, how did you end up working in the White House? Oh, you know, um, it, it was interesting. I'm not sure they'll ever do that again. <laughs> but, you know, it was uh, I, I, I decided that I was I, mean, I saw this program called the White House Fellowship Program. You've probably heard of it. But, you know, it's a it's a it's a great program. Every year they allow anywhere between eleven and and nineteen um, kind of mid grade professionals into the White House, into the different agencies and the departments. You work for a cabinet member or a cabinet um, member equivalent, and uh, and for that entire year you you go through this whole educational program, this um, this professional kind of experiential program, and then also there's a whole travel aspect of it as well, where you, you really see the world, and so. I did that for the whole year. I started off, um, uh, you know, I, un- it was interesting because I, I didn't think that they'd accept me. You know, I mean, I didn't have an Ivy League uh, degree at all. But, um, you know, you go through all of the, the different, uh, you know, regional um, interviews, you go through the national interviews, and you're really, you really, know, a lot of people will talk to you. I mean, everybody from at the time, um, you had Ted Sorensen, who's uh, assistant to John F. Kennedy, and you know you had General Wesley Clark there, Mary Steenberg, and the actress, and and um, and so you know they did accept me, and my brother also was accepted that same year. Uh, he ended up going to work for the National Security Council, and I uh, ended up working, starting off uh, at the Office of Personnel Management, which was responsible for all of the government's civil servants. But it was it was during that time, if you recall, when you had you know, when the, um, the Clinton administration was transitioning to the uh, Bush administration. And so it was, uh, it was really just a great um, experience all the way through. I, uh, you know, and, and, and doing that, I ended up, because it was that transition, I, w- I became the uh, kind of a, the de facto manager for uh, the whole transition for, for, for the civil service. And, um, and then after that was finished, I ended up going to work for the, the vice president of the United States. They were creating an energy task force at the time. And uh, I didn't know a thing about the about energy aside from how to turn the lights on, you know, but I sure <laughs> learned. And, and, and we created the first energy policy for the United States. So it was really incredible. Um, fast forward after we put out the energy policy, um, they they said, you know, we're creating this other task force uh, and it's a Homeland Defense Task Force. And they asked me to join that. 
And then not a week later, that's when 9-11 happened. And, um, and so we quickly then went in uh, and became absorbed into what um, was kind of the precursor of the Homeland Security Council and the Department of Homeland Security was called the Office of Homeland Security. And so, so that's what I did for the, for the next year. And it was, uh, it was a pretty incredible time. Um, and so that's, that's really, how, you know, kind of the, the short story on how I ended up there and, and what I did during that entire time. And, and I heard that um, during that time, you were responsible for creating the color-coded alert system. Could you tell us more about that and how that came about? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, well, if, you know, if, you, if you think back on that time, you, you recall, you know, um, right after 9-11, there were lots and lots of different alerts, and everybody was, um, was very concerned that there were going to be more terrorist attacks. And so during that time, you had uh, the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, and then the FBI Director, Robert Mueller, um, having to stand up in, you know, in the White House briefing room, in the press conference room to uh to kind of raise the alert level of the united states of the country and uh and then as soon as uh governor uh ridge tom ridge came in um they passed that over to him and they were more than happy to do that well you know i i saw and i was in the the press briefing room with governor ridge and and i could just see you know how frustrated he was and, and really unhappy that we just didn't have a formal system for doing that. And so this, I remember this was in December, early December, and there were real threats that we were facing at the time. I mean, they were, they were collaborated. Um, they, 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 they were actual threats that we were facing and they were serious as well. So um, on the walk back through the West wing, I went back to his office and I, um, as he sat there and he just kind of exhaled and I, I said, governor, I said, we'll create a system for you for public warning for terrorist alerts. And, uh, and, and terrorist threats. And he just looked at me and said, you'll do that. And I, I said, yes, sir, we'll do it. We'll do our very best. And I'll come back to you if it's okay after the new year. And uh, he said, yes, it's your project. And so that's how it all happened, you know, but I'll tell you, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't the one who invented the colors. It wasn't my idea. In fact, I'm colorblind. So that's the, that's the great irony in it all. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, that, you know, the enduring, Point, I think is this, and that is that, you know, we, we do need a public warning system for terrorist threats, for these man-made threats, because um, you know, all of us, all of the citizenry of, of the United States, you know, they're the best eyes and ears on the ground that you could possibly ask for. And if you just trust us to do that, um, I think that, you know, it just takes some getting used to and some acclimatization that, uh, that it's, uh, there's, there's no better methodology for that. But if, you know, uh, terrorism um, and, and really public safety, public safety is, is the government's main concern in protecting the United States, protecting the homeland is, is, our, is their primary responsibility. So it can't be a slogan. It's got to be a real system. And that's what we were what we focused on. And, you know, for me, I was uh, a senior at the Naval Academy when 9-11 happened, but I'm aware that many people listening to the show were, you know, quite possibly in elementary school or middle school or high school when 9-11 occurred. Um, I would love to hear you describe what it was like serving in such a high capacity um, during such an incredible, you know, transitional time in our country's history and just operating at the level you were operating at that time? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great question because, you know, you, when, you're, when you're in the military, whether you're, you're enlisted or an officer, you, you show up to work um, in, in the White House, and it's a, it's a great honor. It was a tremendous honor for me to be able to serve there at that time. And, um, and you, you know, but you, in a lot of cases, you take the uniform off during the time that you're there, you're just wearing, you're wearing a suit. And so people don't see you necessarily as military. Um, they can sometimes tell because, you know, you, you have a good haircut and you, you have the bearing, the military bearing that we all have. Uh, but suddenly you can find yourself in uh, situations where you're you're in you're heading up meetings and you have uh, far more responsibility than you would ever have if you were uh, you know in uniform you know and if you're working in your normal day to day job in uniform and so um, that that took some getting used to um, but the blinders kind of just fell off I mean and I can remember on the day on 9/11 uh, I was heading up the elevator I heard that there was a 
that a plane had hit one of the uh, one of the the twin towers, and we all thought it was an accident, like everybody else did. Um, and then we saw the second plane hit, and people asked me what's going on. I said it's it's a coordinated terrorist attack. I walked down to the Secret Service, the uniformed Secret Service agent at the end of the hallway. And uh, I remember his name was Todd. And I said, Todd, what are you hearing? And he, he said, nothing really. And at that point, the uh, the phone rang and and the uh, they, they said that the Pentagon had been hit. And at that point, you know, kind of there was, it wasn't bedlam at all. In fact, it was a very organized response. But suddenly you saw guns coming out of walls and everything that you never ever thought were there. Um, but uh it, it was really just an incredible time. I was, all, you know, in the White House Situation Room when I learned that one of my NCOs who had worked for me in Fifth Special Forces Group um, had been killed, Dan Pettitor. He was one of the very first uh, to die in the war. It was from Friendly Fire, and he was killed along with others who were, had been killed and um, severely wounded during that time. But that really does have a way of focusing you because you never forget about them. And then they become really your impetus for doing everything that you're doing in that environment. And uh, and then for a period of about nine months during that time, everybody was working together and there was no partisanship. There was none of the noise that we're hearing today um, that's really kind of been uh, played up. But um, my my brother also was working, um, as I mentioned, in the National Security Council. And I remember getting a call from him one day um, around six o'clock in the evening. Uh, he was working for General Wayne Downing, uh, who has uh, since passed away, but uh, he headed up the U.S. Special Operations Command, recall. And uh, he he was he had become he had just kind of taken over as the new counterterrorism czar. And my brother, Michael, said, uh, said, John, General Downey wants to see you. And and so I went over there and I said, um, where is he? Because he wasn't there. He goes, he wants you to work on the special operations annex for the invasion of Afghanistan. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, we have to do it. I said, do we have several weeks to work on this? And, you know, by the way, you know, there's a big five-sized building down there that, that should be working on this and should already have a contingency plan. And they said, uh, he said, yeah, but he doesn't like it. And he wants to send over an alternative plan to uh, to the National Security Advisor, uh, Condoleezza Rice. And so uh, we we worked on that, um, but we only had about four hours to, to, to come up with a good outline. And he showed up, um, came up with a conventional plan as well, sent it over to the White House. And then largely that became one of the, um, the, the primary plans that was used for the invasion of Afghanistan just weeks later. So, you know, all those events taken together, um, they can be almost surreal, you know, when you look back on it. But at the time, that's what you're doing. Mm. And, um, and it's really indescribable. And, and, and you could never, ever predict it, of course, but there you are. <laughs> so that's, that was it. You must be the uh, everyone's first choice to grab a beer with. You must have so many incredible. I'm just watching the clock and I'm like, you must have so many incredible stories from uh, your your career. It's uh, It's really unbelievable to think of the things that you've seen and the events you've been present for. Yeah, no, some some great stories, and, and most of them are true. <laughs> <laughs> one one thing um, I'm just curious about, and I'm trying to put this for the lens of maybe someone who's listening who aspires to public service after their military service and aspires to be in many of these rooms that you've been in. I, I was curious to know, you know, you took a, a different career path after this, and I'm wondering, you know, your thought process of if there was a part of you that wanted to continue in at in operating at this high level and, and how you navigated in a different direction from that. Um, you know, it, it like I said, I, I could never have predicted any of it. None of us really um, know what we're going to do once we step out of uniform. I mean, one of the things that I think that's common to all of us is that we just want to make a difference. And uh, and for me, I know, and for many others, we just want to continue to serve in any way we can. And, and if possible, um, it, I, I think it's always great, you know, to be able to kind of have this continued affinity and, and even an affiliation with veterans and veteran families, because, you know, they're, they're our gene pool. You know? and so <laughs> it's always, it's always good to be able to be able to, uh, to do that. And, and, and so that was really, that kind of took over as my direction and it still is, you know, but I've also 
decided, you know, one of the things that I think I can really contribute to, especially having served in the corporate arena, is uh, is to focus on leadership and, and teamwork and values and ethics and all those things that, uh, that really, I think, need a harder look at and maybe even a new approach. And, and so that's really kind of become my, my current direction. And, and before we kind of move on, because I want to ask you questions about that current direction, but I'm just curious if, if you have any words of advice, if someone listening uh, would like to be active in politics or public service or anything like that, do you have any advice on them as they're, as they're maybe on active duty right now preparing for that next step? Yeah, you know, um, for what it's worth, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, everybody has to figure it out for themselves. That's the bottom line. But, you know, it, it, I would I would say, first of all, know yourself. Um, and and most of us do. I mean, you can't help but go through even several years in the military and any of the services and, and have a real good idea of what you stand for and, and what you, you want your mission to be. But all those values that were that were taught to us as kids growing up there or as a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, they stay with you, and, um, and and you don't ever let them go. If you do, then it's your own fault because they're things that you've been taught. They they're, they're proven to work. Um, all of us have different leadership styles. We know it works for us, and and, and my belief is that that we're all leaders um, at any level because we lead through our own example, and hopefully, it's a good example um, that we actively convey every single day. But um, but. The one thing I can tell you, um, and especially, you know, having stepped out of uniform and working, you know, in the C-suites is that is that uh, character uh, counts way more than experience ever will. Um, I don't care how much experience you have, but if you don't have character, then everything goes out the window. And uh, you can develop all the, the competencies and the skills over time, but the character is something that you either have or or, that you, or you don't. And so... When um, when we make that civilian um, that excuse me that uh, that transition to um, to the civilian workforce, you know what I tell people is that you should be absolutely confident in your ability to succeed and, and 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 to make a difference, not not in an arrogant way at all, but but quietly. It's that kind of quiet professionalism that we bring to the table that is just worth so much. I you know I, I can remember when I was working at the at the White House. Um, I, there was a guy also working there. He was a White House fellow, and um, he was a billionaire. <laughs> his, his, uh, his name is Steve Poisner. He's the guy that took uh, cell phone tech or GPS technology and attached it to cell phones, and he sold that to, to Qualcomm, and, and he's done that several t- times since in, in similar ventures. And we were sitting and having breakfast one day, and he said, you know, he said, John, he goes, you guys, you, you just don't know how much you're worth. And, and I said, no, no, Steve, I know exactly how much I'm worth, brother, and I am in the red. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, no, no. He said, that's not what I'm talking about, man. He said, what I'm talking about is you guys have the ability, you in the military um, have the ability to both plan and execute. And I can tell you that you just don't find that in the corporate world. And so you, you, you should just know that. He said, your challenge is going to uh, is gonna be to get people to understand that. And, but once they understand it, once they understand what you can do, um, you're worth an awful lot, not just in terms of dollars, but just in terms of being a team player for them. So, you know, it's, it's that leadership and, and, and that ability to convey all that and to do all that for them that, that really matters. So I tell people, just be absolutely confident in what you have. You, you already know how to do all of these things. You're already a leader in spades, and um, and you'll show up, and you'll you'll make a huge difference for them. Mm, I love that. I love that uh, that message of confidence and that message of you know that it's it you're you're almost making this into just a smaller tactical problem of how to explain your background so someone understands it, but the uh, the ability and the talent and the, the character, it, 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 all of that is there. It's just basically putting the dots together so someone can understand that. Yeah. Well, you know, and I mean, you went to the Naval Academy and you were taught this at an early age too, is that, you know, uh, you know, leaders are, are nothing more than dealers and, and hope and confidence. And, and really all you need to be a leader is that level of optimism and, and the vision and, and your own personal example. And, and then everything after that, you know, it's just being able to, to operate, you know, on the ground, you know, and, and, and interact with people and, uh, and take care of people. So, 
that's what it's that's what it is mm. um what what got you into writing was that something you had always aspired to do or how did you introduce that to the portfolio of things that you do well you know i'll, I'll tell you Justin. i i um it's, it's a great question i I think I, I, I've always written, but I, you know, I, I never really saw myself writing a book at all. Um, but, you know, we come back from all these different garden spots that we deploy to and people ask you, what was it like? Um, and after a lot of different failed attempts at trying to do that, I just said, you know what, I'll, I'll write a book. I'll, I'll try to explain it that way. And, and, and initially it was, uh, it was going to be a nonfiction book, kind of a memoir. Um, but then I realized that the Department of Defense would never let me publish it. So I said, well, I'll, I'll turn it into a novel, but, um, and I thought that that would be easy, but that was far from easy because, um, to, to write a novel, you have to learn the whole craft of, of, uh, of writing a novel. And that is, you know, everything from, from character development to plot and pacing and setting and, and, and on and on. And, um, and so it took me a long time, probably a, a good, you know, 15 years. And, and so that was really the, the genesis of, of the Lazarus covenant. And since then I've written, written two more. So, um, that was, uh, that, that was really kind of how I got into it. And I really enjoy it because it's also, um, I found, you know, pretty therapeutic too, because you're able to think a lot about a lot of different events in your life. You're able to think of, about a lot of the different people that you've met along the way. And, um, and it, it really does help, you know, so I, I encourage everybody, um, to write, you know, and it, you don't have to publish it, but just have it. And, and, you know, because everybody has their own story. So, that's really kind of how I got into it. We've had a couple authors on the show before, and for listeners, I'll add those in the show notes if, if this is a topic that interests you. But I, I would love to learn more about um, your writing style and process. Is this, uh, I, I remember one of the, um, Jack Carr was on the show recently, and he talked about, um, at least initially, he was really just being able to write before work in the early morning and at the late night, and he was just filling the crevices and nooks and crannies of his day with writing. I'm just kind of curious, like what, what did you find worked for you in terms of a rhythm and, and um, setting up a system that helped you continue to write? Well, you know, it, and it's, uh, you learn as you go along too, because even after you've finished your first or second or 15th book, you know, I think that you're, you always start off with a blank page and, and we're all different. Um, you know, all authors are different. They all do things their own way. Um, some of them, as you mentioned, you know, you, you, you need that seclusion, you know, to write. And, and that always helps. I mean, writing at, you know, four o'clock in the morning for me um, is absolutely the best time uh, before the rest of the house wakes up, before your emails and the, all the calls start working in before you have to go to work. But, you know, I can, you know, I, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a bit different in that I can write anywhere. I can, you know, I can also write in a crowded coffee shop, um, and uh, and I and I can also write, you know, on a on a, a darkened, you know, C5 or C17, you know, that's going someplace. And so it was, uh, you know, I I, I really don't need, um, you know, to have it completely quiet. I don't need to be distraction free. W one of the things that does help me as far as getting organized is that uh, I'll, you know, I'll tr I'll tr I'll try to start outlining a story. Um, but it'll never ever follow the outline completely because once the characters and you know that you're successful, um, you're on, you're on the right path um, when you're writing is when the characters kind of take over the story, and um, and that happens pretty pretty quickly um, in my experience. But I'll start off with you know um, uh, a, a program like Scrivener, um, which is a, a a software program that helps you kind of organize all your thoughts and helps you write. But it won't write the story for you at the end of the day. That's that's your responsibility. So, um, but I don't have I don't have any problems focusing. You know, even in a distraction filled environment, it's uh, that's something I've always been able to do regardless. What was the you know once the story started to take shape? At, at what point did you engage with a publisher, and what was that process like? Yeah, you know, we all, you know, if you want to write a book and you want to publish it, now there's lots of options. You can self-publish and you can do, um, you can go a lot of different routes, um, but, uh, which I think are all fabulous, by the way. I mean, it kind of frees you, you know, you up for a lot of different possibilities. But, you know, I went through the whole process of getting an agent and I found a great agent and he was, um, he was really interested in the book and he was really enthusiastic uh, as well. And, um, 
you know, but you, even trying to find an agent, you go through lots of rejections. It's just inevitable. Um, and that's OK. I kind of view it as is dating, you know, either, you know, if they don't want you, you don't want them. <laughs> so, you know, you, uh, you know, and after you find the agent, then you, you go off and, you know, the agent tries to, to find a good publisher for you. And I, I can remember, um, I had, uh, one publisher call us and he said, uh, he said, John, I, I really, we, we, we love your book. This is the same one, by the way, that, uh, that, that uh, published all of Tom Clancy's novels. And he said, we love your book and we just need a few things to change. And I said, Oh, what's that? And, and he said, well, we'd like to have all of the characters be American. And we'd like uh, for uh, all of the locations, the setting locations to be in the United States. (laughs) I said, well, you you don't, you don't want an international thriller. Then you want a domestic thriller. He said, exactly. (laughs) So I, uh, I, I, you know, but you know, if your goal is to get published, you know, you follow that advice, and and so I can remember I was in Copper Mountain, right, near, you know, close to where you are, and and uh, we were we were up there, and I think it was on my honeymoon, which wasn't a good timing, but uh, but I changed the whole book, you know, over a course of about four weeks, and um, and I, you know, but when I finished, I just didn't like it as much, and I said, you know what, no, we're going to go back to the to the original story, and. Um, and I just found a, a small publisher that was willing to do that. And, you know, the trade off there is you don't have the distribution, but, you know, you can keep it in print for a lot longer. In fact, we're going to um, it's been out of print for, for several years, but it's going to go back into print very shortly. And because uh, I just think it's a good story. And um, and so you have you have lots of different publishers out there. You just have to find the right one. Lots of different agents just find the right one that uh, is really enthusiastic about your book. And um, and, and the rest takes care of itself. I, I can only imagine how, if I put myself in your shoes there, that would have been an excruciating decision between, you know, this, this monumental publisher and the, the dreams of everything that goes with that. And then having this gut feel of like, I, I really want to preserve this in the way that I feel is right. And, and this is my work and, and maintaining the integrity of it. How did you approach that decision? Was that was that a very easy decision for you, or is there a lot of back and forth about what to do on that? Oh, there's lots of back and forth, and and it's never easy because. But you know, when you write a book, um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I mean that's kind of your baby, you know. And uh, and then you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, is, is that what I want to throw out on the street, you know? Um, and 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 so for me. The, the Lazarus Covenant, which was this book we're talking about, was was intensely personal because it uh, it has. I mean, I would say a good ninety percent of everything that's in the book, everything from characters to uh, to to the plot, um, is was was based on real people and real places that I was. And 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 so when you have that, if you change it too much, um, then at that point you you start. There, there, it's a trade-off process, and I really wasn't willing at the time to make some of those trade-offs because a lot of the characters are based on, you know, some my friends who are no longer with us, and so that's that's really kind of how how I arrived at that decision. I said, you know, I, I wrote this to honor their memory, and um, and I'm just going to stick with it. So it, at the end of the day, um, initially it was hard, but then it wasn't. Mm. Do you have any advice if someone listening aspires one day to be an author? What, what advice would you give to them? Um, you know, what I would say is, is just write and, and never stop, never quit. Don't worry about getting it perfect at first. Write about the topic or the story that you want to tell and that, that really nobody else can. Because if somebody else could tell the story, if they have told the story, why why even bother? But um, but it, in, a lot, in a lot of cases, I, what I would say is, you know, start with the question, why? You know, why do you want to write? Because if you don't know the answer to that question, you know, why would anybody else be interested in reading what you have to say? And, and then just go from there. Um, and, and, then, um, and then I would say if you're, if you're writing fiction, start um, with why, but then move on very quickly to that question of, of if. If this happened, what then? You know, in the in the case of um, my last my last novel, the the fifth column uh, that I co-authored with a good friend of mine, uh, Tom Rendell, uh, the story asks um, the question: You know, what if our nation was taken over by a group that was solely, you know, motivated by by profit and and and, and personal enrichment, and, and and could that ever happen? And then if it happened, 
you know, who could stop them? And, and so that's really kind of at the core of, of what that story is about. So, um, yeah, my belief is, is that, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to write a, um, a story, especially if it's fiction, then the, the best stories out there, they make you laugh, they make you cry when you least expect it, um, they keep you up at night, and, and more than anything else, though, they make you think. And so ultimately that's really kind of been my goal for, for all the, the novels that I've written is to make you think about things that you might not ordinarily think about and, um, and, and put it into a different context perhaps. So that's, uh, that's really the only advice I can offer, but, you know, just, just keep writing and, and never stop because, you know, once you finish that draft, you're going to go back and you're going to revise it. And that becomes your opportunity to make it as perfect as you could possibly make it. Hmm. You, you, you strike me, John, as just, um, someone who is admirably resilient and and i picture you you are in in the room at the highest level of office you are in incredible situations there you you start traveling the world and teaching about leadership you uh want to write a book and so you go out and do that and you face you know i'm sure untold obstacles in each of these and you walk away from this incredible publishing opportunity I'm just really impressed with the amount of, I, I interpret it as kind of resilience and self-confidence and self-belief. And I'm juxtaposing that in my mind right now with so many of the people that I speak with who listen to this show and, and myself included. You know, when you approach that military transition, there is oftentimes a lot of self-doubt and there's a oftentimes a lot of questioning of what to do and will I find another way and all of these things. And I, I just wonder if you have any advice about that, about cultivating that confidence and cultivating that resilience and the ability to set, uh, to face setbacks and not be deterred from pursuing something that you really believe in. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I really think that uh, for all of us, we have to determine our own path. I mean, I'll tell you what, I've, I've had as many self doubts and, um, and I've been broken Lord knows, you know, <laughs> along the way. And, hmm. you know, and, but, but, but all those failures, you know, it, I mean, failure is, is a good thing because you, if, as long as you learn from it, if you don't learn from it, um, then, then it's, then it is a failure. But if you learn from it, you just keep moving on, then it just becomes kind of a step along the way. I, you know, I have a, a cousin of mine, he's a great, uh, skier and he writes uh, for a lot of you know the new york times and a lot of uh, our door magazines but i asked him one day because i was watching him ski these black slopes i, I said uh I, I said chris how how do you do that you know i mean because I, I whenever i hit these moguls i, I just i fall man <laughs> he, said, he said he said no he said he said the best way to ski these is just to, to all these moguls is just to ignore them mm. and um and i and i tell you sometimes that's really good advice for life too as a metaphor you know just ignore those bumps and just keep going in the direction. It's never going to be a linear path. Um, sometimes it's pretty circuitous, but as long as you are heading off in the direction that you want to go, nobody can take that away from you. Um, so do everything on your own terms, you know, lead through your own example. You know, if you can continue to serve and, and continue to grow. I mean, today um, there's a, you know, there, there's, you know, a lot of us come back from uh, a lot of these combat zones and, and, uh, you know, we hear an awful lot about post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but there's a great organization down in, in Bluemont, Virginia. Um, it's, uh, it's called Boulder Crest Retreat for Military and Veteran Wellness. And, and, you know, they've written a whole curriculum on this. And one of the things that, that they're all about is they refuse to call it post-traumatic stress. They call it post-traumatic growth. And, um, and so if you can grow from those, those different experiences, then, uh, then you're, you're not only going to be able to achieve what you want, you're going to oftentimes be able to excel and, and, and go well beyond those, those goals that you set for yourself. So the, the, the other thing I would say is just tell your story. All of us have a story. Um, I, I can remember uh, when I was working at the Pentagon, I would uh, oftentimes at lunch, I would just go out for a run. Um, and then when, and when I got to the Arlington National Cemetery, I would just walk through there. I would go through all the different sections and, um, you know, you oftentimes end up over at the tomb of the unknown soldier, but, you know, all the different names that are in those, you know, in granite there, the one thing that struck me one day was, you know, everybody here has a story, you know, but how, how many of us really know those stories and, and are they recorded? So, 
that was that would be the other thing I would say is think about everything that you've achieved, everything that you've done over these years that you've been in uniform, and and then record that in some way, shape, or form, and you'll be amazed at really kind of how therapeutic it can be for you too. That's incredible. I love that. Um, I and I love that image of the moguls. I just think that's such a beautiful metaphor. Um, could you share, um, you know, I know many of our listeners are earlier in their military career and maybe transitioning after just a few years, but I know that others are serving a full 20 years or more before that transition. And for someone who's maybe doing a full career in the military before their transition, do you have any advice for them about approaching that transition? And, and I'm, particularly interested because you've had such a full you had such a full military career but you've had it sounds like an equally full civilian career since then and so I'm, I'm just curious any advice you would have to them well I, you know I think that um, the first thing to keep in mind is is that you know have a plan but then also realize that that plan is going to um, frequently um, go to the the wayside very quickly but it's okay you know as long as uh, as long as you can kind of um, kind of have an understanding of what it is that you want to do and, and understand also you know what your own mission is and I um, mean it doesn't have to be a specific you know military mission but what is it that you what defines you and then um, as you look at different opportunities think about those things that um, that that kind of would would be parallel or fall into you know those categories of things that you're you're enthusiastic about the other thing i would say and one of the best pieces of advice anybody ever gave to me when i was working at the white house um was donna shalala she was the remember the secretary of health and human services uh, i think the longest serving one in history and and uh she told me one day she said john um she said uh I just have one piece of advice for you. And I said, what's that, ma'am? And, and she said, uh, never eat lunch alone. Mm. <laughs> I, I thought I was great because, you know, um, what she was telling me was that, you know, you're here in this, in this environment. And, I mean, and really she's talking about any environment. But, but if you're here, get to know people. Because um, so frequently today, you know, everybody's on their iPhones or, you know, they're on the Internet or, you know, you know these days playing Fortnite, you know, whatever <laughs> it might be. And, uh, you know, um, but just get out, you know, and talk to people and learn their story and tell them what you're interested in. Because if you're able to do that, um, they're going to, first of all, know you. Um, they're going to have a relationship with you. And it's those relationships that matter, because if 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 they. Uh, if they know kind of what it is that you want to do, if they see an opportunity, they'll pick up the phone and they'll call you because um, because they know that you've got character and that they also know the direction that you're moving in. So don't hesitate to cultivate those relationships. I mean, you can spend a lot of time on LinkedIn and Indeed and all these other job sites out there. Um, and occasionally they might work, um, but everybody else in the world is looking at those things, too. Um, and, and really my experience has been if you're looking for a career opportunity, uh, it's the relationships that are going to get you there. Mm. It's, I, I think there's so much truth to what you're saying. I love that, that um, just everything. Your, your advice is very dense in the, uh, the quality of, of things that you're providing here. One, one other question I always like to ask is I'm just I'm in particular thinking of uh, people who are on uh, maybe a ship right now or deployed overseas or anyone who's on active duty who uh, might not have access to everything, but maybe they have access to another podcast or a book or a conference or an online course. And it was just curious if there's anything that's impacted your career that you've read or listened to or enjoyed that you would pass on to listeners to check out. Well, Justin, I mean, first of all, thank you for, for, for doing this podcast because I think it's really valuable. I mean, and there's, there's other ones that are out there. I mean, all you have to do is, 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 is Google them. And, and, and I, I think, you know, people put a lot of thought into these and a lot of effort as well, but um, you know, a, a really great one that I always like to listen to in addition is uh, mentors for military. I don't know if you've um, listened to that before, but that's almost like kind of being in a special forces team room. You know, you, you listen to all these people from really, you know, kind of all these different international military experiences and listen to their stories. And that's really been valuable as well. Um, Robert Gowan and Mike, uh, Sergeant Major Mike Pritz and, and other, 
others are are, are running that. Um, but then also, you know, you've got uh, you know all the TED talks that are out there. In fact, I think there's a podcast. What's it called? Um, uh, TED Ra- TED Radio Hour yep. or something like that. Yep. And and that's and, and that's a good one too because they focus on one theme. But you know, for all these TED talks, just pick one and listen to it. You know, you don't have to listen to the whole thing. Listen to the highlights, and um, and they'll give you some some really good perspectives on life. You know, as far as books, um, you know, I, I, everybody's got their own list. Um, but the the ones that I would really immediately look at, and the ones that have really made a difference for me, um, are you know, first of all, Good to Great by Jim Collins, because that talks about you know it talks about resilient companies. But I think it quickly translates if you if you look at it hard to resilient uh, people as well. And 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 if you just if you kind of internalize all the lessons. Um, and look through it through that lens, then it's a model for all of us to kind of achieve some some real enduring success. Another one, which is great, and it's not that long, is uh, Simon Sinek. Start with why, and that gets to you know kind of um, you know for for whatever we do, start with why, because his whole point is is that people don't buy you know um, necessarily who you are or what you do. They they buy why you do it, and so if you start with that, then um, then that is, is always, it's a great way to start, you know, telling your own story as well. And then the final one I would say is, um, is Grant's memoirs. If you haven't read that, I mean, it's, it's by far, I I believe the best memoir ever written. And, um, and it's not just by a president, but by anyone it's, um, it's, it's really interesting that, that, you know, he didn't focus on the presidency at all in those memoirs. It's all about his civil war experiences. And, and, um, and, and then he completed it five years before, or five days before he died. Um, and then it was Mark Twain, his good friend, Mark Twain that published it. So it's really an incredible account as well. But, um, I would just say as, as often as you can, and whenever you can just read constantly, whether it's, you know, regular, you know, hard copy books or eBooks or audio books and, um, and, and, you know, because, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to you're going to step out of uniform and um, you're just going to be going full tilt. But the more experiences that you have in, in what you're able to read and listen to, I think, is going to offer you some different perspectives and some good perspectives. Oh, this is great. And and for listeners in the show notes at beyondtheuniform.io, I'll have links to all the different resources that John uh, just mentioned. And I, I, for one, I'm going to check out Grant's memoirs. I haven't haven't read that. I, I did read Start With Why and completely agree with that, but I think that those all sound incredible. Well, I, um, John, I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. I just, um, I wish I could bottle up the the energy you bring to life and the, um, just the candor with which you speak, but the, the way in which you view the world, I find so refreshing and energizing. And I always like to keep the last question open-ended And that is that we've covered a lot of ground and and I tried to ask questions that I think would help our audience. I'm sure there's things that I didn't ask about or things that we didn't cover that you may want to impart to listeners. And so I'd love to just to turn over to you for any final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave with uh, with listeners. Well, you know, I'll I'll tell you, we've talked about a lot, Justin, and, and, you know, once again, uh, you you really have my admiration for for doing this, um, you know, for for all of us, because it's a big deal. And, you know, and as you're looking for kind of your direction in life, once you step out of uniform, it's it's far more art than science. But, you know, it's uh, the the one thing I would say is just be absolutely confident in in what you bring to the table, because as uh, as 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 somebody who's served in our military, you have you have um, no idea right now what it is that you're going to to be able to contribute, and it, and it's it's immeasurable. And and I'll tell you, uh, really stay connected to the to the veteran community as well, because uh, everybody you know loves to tell their stories, and everybody um, has has a lot to offer. And those those relationships that you already have are gonna are gonna follow you for the rest of your life. And uh, and then if you ever find yourself in any kind of adversity. Um, it, they're going to help you through that, and and that's what the other thing I would say is when you're when you're facing any kind of adversity, whether it's you know job related or personal or whatever it might be, it's it, you know view it as as an opportunity and and as a challenge because I've I got to have a good friend of mine his his name he's a uh, a friend uh, he was um, Charlie Plum he was a POW in the Hanoi Hilton and he has a great saying he said uh, he said John he said uh, 
adversity is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I look, I look at that. And I'll tell you, I mean, I thought about his adversity that he faced and, you know, he's the biggest optimist in the world. And so, you know, when you, when you meet somebody like that and when they give you that level of hope, um, that's what leaders do. And, and so I'll just leave you with that. Um, it, it, there's, there's an awful lot of, uh, ahead of everybody, and we all have a, an awful lot to look forward to. So thanks, Justin, for, for, for everything you and your team are doing. Thank you, John. And for listeners, you can find John at johnfenzel.com. You can find his books, The Fifth Column, The Sterling Forest, and The Lazarus Covenant, all on Amazon or within the show notes. There'll be links to all of those as well. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Justin. Bye-bye. All right. Well, thank you for listening to my interview with John Fenzel. I hope you enjoyed it. I thought he was just such an exceptional uh, man. Uh, It was just impressive hearing about all the things he's accomplished, but also that mindset that he's maintained to achieve those things in and out of the military. Uh, Beyond the Uniform is produced and edited by me, Justin Asiri. The editor for our show is Kathleen Dillon. Our director of outreach responsible for finding guests as well as finding sponsors is Steve Bain. And our data and analytic data analytics and insight advisor, Andrew Woolridge, helps us understand where we're getting traffic and how we can get more. If you're enjoying the show, I'd greatly appreciate it if you share it with your friends and colleagues and coworkers and anyone who might benefit from the one episode away from 200 episodes we've got now that are completely free and designed to help members of the armed forces identify and obtain their ideal civilian career. Positive reviews on iTunes help as well. There's a donation button on our site. There is a sponsorship program. So many different ways to help the effort of what we're doing. And feedback is not the least of them. So if there's a way that you think we can do a better job, if there are better questions we can ask our guests, better guests we can have on the show, or just different guests, uh, drop me a line at justin at beyondtheuniform.io. Reply to our newsletter, which you can sign up for on the site. Uh, Find me on LinkedIn. It may take me a week or two to get back to you, but I promise you I will. Thanks. Have a fantastic week. I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career. Take care.